Hi, this is Wale Oluwade. Today I'm teaching on the meaning of life. What is life? What is the purpose of our lives as individuals? Now, there are many definitions and descriptions, observations and conclusions about life that people have. Let's examine a few of a few popular descriptions of life. Some say that life is a journey. Some say that life is a mystery. Some say life is a wilderness. Some describe life as a gift. Some say life is a riddle or puzzle. Some say life is an adventure. Some say that life is a race. That is a sprint. It could be a sprint or marathon. Some say that life is for the living. So in Nigeria, you hear phrases such as, oh, we're chopping life, you know, we're having fun, we're jollofing, and all of that, you know. Some say life is a school. And then some say that life is a test or examination, linking life again to the idea of being a school. Some say that life is, 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 is a battle or warfare. Then some say that life is for, this, is for service, both to God and to man. Now, many philosophers over the ages have summarized life um, based on their learning and experience into any of these different descriptions. But this teaching isn't a philosophy teaching. This, this is a teaching about life from the perspective and opinion of the creator and giver of life, who is God. Somewhere, somebody somewhere on this earth needs to hear this message before it is too late. You need to listen and, and watch this video before your life is over. To me, as a Christian, a believer and follower of Jesus, his ideas and meaning, the ideas on the meaning and the purpose of life is critical. So Jesus stated categorically in Matthew 22 verses 30, 35 to 49, hear what Jesus Christ said about life. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question saying, testing him and saying, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love the Lord, your, you, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what is life from Jesus' perspective? From the quotation I just read, what did Jesus describe life as? To love, Jesus explained that life is to love and serve God completely and to serve humanity too. Did you hear that? Jesus Christ said that life is to love and serve God and to serve humanity completely. Interestingly, these two laws are conjoined. That is, you should, you should love and serve God and you should love and serve humanity. These two laws are conjoined. What does that mean? Because you cannot love God and hate man and you cannot say, I, I love man and hate God. You know, it, 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 it cannot happen. You've got to, if you love God, you have to love your fellow human being. Now, the Bible says expressly, because don't just take my word for it. Let me give you a scripture to, a scripture to back what I just said up. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 to 21, the Bible says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who loves, who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that is God, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Did you hear that? Oh, how I love to read and study the scriptures. Because look at such brutal brevity. I mean, so simple, so straightforward. You, you cannot miss it. You cannot misunderstand it. And this teaching is to all men of all religious beliefs. Not just Christians or Muslims, every, no matter the religion you claim to practice, this teaching is for you. Why? Why is this teaching? It's, it's, this teaching is about life so that you do not regret at the end of, of your life. Now, another man, Solomon, had his own take on life as well. Interestingly, Solomon was reputed to be the wisest man in his own era. Solomon said a few things about life, but sadly, these things he said were at the end of his sojourn. So let's examine a few of Solomon's thoughts on life as he stated himself in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 4, verses 4 to 21. Hear what Solomon says. Listen, I made my works great. I'm reading Solomon. I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. 
I made myself gardens and orchards, and I planted all kinds of fruits in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants and had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all those who were before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men, and musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. And also my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from, from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my reward from all my labor. Solomon is speaking and we're continuing. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on, on the labor which I had toiled all this life. And indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Then I turned myself to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who only succeeds the king? Only what he has already done. Then I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I myself perceive that the same event happens to them all. So I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, this also is vanity. For there is no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever, since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die as the fool? Therefore, I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me. For all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Then I hated my, all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise, he will, he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will rule over all my labor in which I have toiled and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. Therefore, I turned my heart and despaired of all the labor in which I had toiled under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is, is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This also is vanity and grasp and, and a great evil. Guess what? That was a very long quotation from Solomon, a, the wisest man of his era. I want you to remember that. But do you see the thoughts of the wisest man? What a pitiable and miserable life. Oh, what a pitiable and miserable life. I just read it to you. This is a life of regret and sorrow. I pray for you watching and listening to me. May you not regret at the end of your life in Jesus' name. Oh my, we've been taught and raised to believe in the great lie and heresy that Solomon was a great man who's to be envied and emulated. Books and DVDs and seminars and conferences on the, on the great wisdom of Solomon. And most of these are just junk and complete hogwash, arrant nonsense. It is an egregious heresy straight from hell itself. Why? Solomon, yes, Solomon was the wisest man of his time. He had wealth, riches, honor, fame, splendor, glory, and majesty. Oh, Solomon was the definition of kingly majesty and splendor. I mean, Solomon's glory and majesty made the queen of Sheba who came to visit to collapse in shock. Solomon lived life to the fullest that was obtainable of his time, yet his life is a study in self-aggrandizement and obscene consumption. And at the end, it all ended very badly for Solomon. The wisest man in his era became the most foolish at his death. Why? David, Solomon's father, King David, gave Solomon a united kingdom. But by Solomon's actions, the kingdom that, that, that his father gave to him was balkanized. The kingdom was broken apart by God. 
Why? Because Solomon got busy in self-indulgence and self-fulfillment to the extent that the more he acquired things, the more things Solomon acquired, the more wealth Solomon got, the, the more foreign women he got, the more he wanted. And at the end, the 700 princesses whom he married and the extra 300 concubines from the same nations God had warned Solomon not to marry from or have any dealings with, they turned Solomon's heart away from serving God. And remember, life, we said, from the lips of Jesus meant to love and to serve God and to love and serve humanity. I have no doubt whatsoever where Solomon is presently. The grand apostasy and backsliding of Israel and Judah was all traceable to Solomon choosing a life of wanton self-indulgence rather than service to God and to humanity. In that long quotation I read, the words I, myself, me were mentioned 35 times. It was all about Solomon. Everything Solomon did was all about himself not about anybody. It was all about I, me, myself. I did this for me. Whatever my eyes wanted, I gave to you. Listen to me, please. Jesus spoke derisively about Solomon. He compared Solomon to lilies and flowers, the basest of living things, whereas he called paradise Abraham's bosom. Jesus called paradise Abraham's bosom, but he compared Solomon to the basest of things, lilies and flowers. You can find it out in Matthew 6, 28 to 29 and Luke 16, verse 22. In the entire New Testament, Solomon was only mentioned once by Jesus in a very condescending analogy. In whatever part of the New Testament where Solomon was mentioned, I can't even recollect. Just in passing, there was nothing from Solomon to impact us. All the great prophets of old were quoted copiously. David and Abraham were linked directly as Jesus' ancestors, but not Solomon. Why? Because at the end, Solomon failed woefully. The wisdom given to Solomon by God did not profit him after all. Now, let me say this as a roundup. Why did Jesus and his disciples avoid money and material wealth like a plague? Why did Jesus Christ and his disciples shun and abstain from, 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 from grasping, from material acquisition of wealth, from this inordinate acquisition for wealth? Why did Jesus teach his disciples to shun such a lifestyle? John says there are many things Jesus did and taught which if it were written down, the, the entire world would not contain the books. You can find that in John 21 verse 25. I believe by the illumination of the Holy Spirit that Jesus repeatedly emphasized to his disciples why they must shun wealth and riches by all means. And I say, I mean the, 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 the acquisition, the craving, the insatiable craving for material acquisition. Because Jesus said very clearly in Matthew 6 verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he would hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. Then he says, you cannot serve God and mammon. Did you hear that? You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, what is mammon? Mammon, in the New Testament of the Bible, is commonly thought to mean money or material wealth or any entity that promises wealth and is associated with the greedy pursuit of gain. Mammon in Hebrew simply means money, the God of money. So Jesus, without a scintilla of equivocation, stated quite simply, serving God and at the same time striving to amass material wealth under all the subtle guises cannot happen. The two do not gel together. You cannot serve God and grasping, you know, insatiable wealth for material consumption. This obscene passion, this unquenchable desire to acquire everything. The two cannot go together. So you have to choose one or the other. Now this teaching is critically important, especially in Africa, especially in Nigeria, where the youth have been indoctrinated by the examples of our leaders to think everything about life is all about grasping, it's all about how much money you can make. Life has been reduced in Nigeria to, 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 to inordinate love and affection for material things. So this message is critical. 
Because there are many billionaires and multi-billionaires in different currencies of the world who are going straight to hellfire. Am I against being rich or wealthy? No, it is what you do with the wealth and the riches. And if that is your passion, you cannot make heaven. I didn't say that. Now, Jesus said, equally he stated, that for the rich to enter into heaven will be like a camel passing through the eye of a needle. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. So, what is my conclusion then? Life is about loving God and loving humanity. It is about serving God and serving mankind. And you cannot claim to love God who you don't see when you are not, kind, when you are not a kind person to your fellow human beings who you see all around you. In other words, to serve humanity is the greatest service to God. If you, if you claim to be serving God, your service to God must involve serving humanity. Serving mankind is the greatest service to God. Like Jesus said, like, like, live like Jesus and his disciples and your name will endure for all generations. But if you follow in Solomon's example, you will regret your life at the end. Everything Solomon spent his wisdom, intelligence and resources are massive. God blew them away. Everything. I mean everything. Even the great temple Solomon built, God destroyed it. God brought foreign invaders. They burnt that glorious temple Solomon built. They burnt it down. It was desecrated. Because it was, Solomon departed from what God had told him to do. Foreign, foreign invaders came and plundered Solomon's wealth and riches. And the great temple he built with such glory and beauty was desecrated, it was looted, and finally burnt by infidels. Even in these contemporary times, the only wealth that will endure are those that are put to the use of humanity. Some years ago, as I, as I conclude now, I was researching on scholarships of, for some of my nephews and nieces. Now I discovered that in the United States alone, they have well over 10,000 foundations and endowments on education, health, and so forth. Now, these are global institutions that give grants, scholarships, and aids. Guess what? Most of these are by private individuals, not by the United States government. And who are these individuals? They, they were mostly, you know, wealthy entrepreneurs, mostly wealthy entrepreneurs. Some of them have gone, some of them, a few of them are still here. You know, I used to ponder why anyone will work a mass wealth and then turn around to give it all away. That's why you have the Carnegie Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, the Ford Foundation. And lately, you have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation doing great stuff all over Africa. I hope you know that Bill Gates has committed almost all his wealth to charity. He has vowed to give, all, to give up almost all his wealth, you know, substantial inheritance, you know, to, most of his wealth to charity and not give anything major. As inheritance to his children and more than this by Bill Gates's singular action several billionaires have signed up into what is called the giving pledge whereby they would give most of them have pledged to give away most of their wealth to charitable causes among these who have signed up to join Bill Gates you have Warren Buffett Larry Page Michael Bloomberg Mark Zuckerberg Gordon Ramsay and so many others who have all committed to the same ideal of Bill Gates you know what? Most of these guys don't even profess Christianity or Islam like we do here with such hypocrisy. Now, I mean, imagine there is a guy at CNN, Anderson Cooper, who, who is a direct descendant of the great American entrepreneur Cornelius Vanderbilt. Yet, Anderson Cooper is working his socks off at CNN. But how about you? Most Nigerians, Niger, Nigerian leaders who have stolen the nations blind the reason why they do that is because they don't want their children or grandchildren or descendants to suffer. You really? You, you, you can die and have control over what happens after you're gone? Learn from Solomon. Learn from Solomon. There are families here in Nigeria whose patriarch has died. And before the patriarch is even buried, a fight to the death has already begun. Why? Because of inheritance. What I know is this, whatever wealth you leave for your children and descendants, it is only a matter of time before it is all blown away. Blown away. Why? Because wealth is not meant to be heaped up for your descendants and, 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 and posterity. 
the, wealth, the reason for wealth is for the service of mankind. The reason for wealth and riches is to serve God through the service of mankind. So give your children quality education. Give them a loan to start off their businesses or whatever they choose to do. But to give your children and descendants wealth and riches so they don't have to suffer, you are lying. You are simply joking. Learn from Solomon. No matter how smart or wise you think you are, you are not smarter than Jesus. You are not smarter than God. The choice is yours to make. I urge you, I encourage you, be wise. Don't, don't leave great wealth and riches to your descendants. God will blow it away. Use your wealth and your riches to serve humanity commit your great wealth and riches i hope it was gotten genuine in the first place if your wealth and riches is gotten genuinely commit it to the service of mankind but if you got your wealth illegally if you got your wealth through crooked means guess what i have news for you the bible says wealth get gained dishonestly will take wings and fly away efcc will take it from you if efcc does not take it i can guarantee you god will take it from you to the last dime because that is crookedness, that is ungodly, that is satanic. And that is one of the reasons why Africa, especially Nigeria, is underdeveloped. So, I urge you, watch this message. I urge you to watch it all over again. Share these videos with, with everybody on your contact list and on all your social media you know, um, handles. You know, follow me on YouTube, on Twitter, and on my Facebook page. These videos are also there. I have so many other videos that are life-changing, life-impacting. Go to my YouTube channel and, and watch, you know, subscribe to my YouTube channel, you know, and like I said, in this season of COVID, stay safe and stay blessed.